So far we've explored the idea of Max Stirner's unique, who rejects Hegel's world spirit, and we've examined how Death Drive can be a perverse inversion of the idea of world spirit, but instead of reaching a glorious end of history, it will be a return to nothingness, as in endless repetition and withdrawal. Confronted with this idea, the unique suddenly seems puzzling. Where does Stirner get the motivation to throw off the modes and repetitions of society that tend towards a safer life of withdrawal and avoidance of pain? It's hard to say, because with the destruction of greater causes that try to tie him into their cause, Stirner's analysis just about ends. And it seems almost obvious that the unique on their own would desire this freedom. Stirner, considering the time he lived in, already anticipated a lot of ideas that would later be developed more by Nietzsche and would ultimately result in existentialism. And this is precisely where we need to look if we want to answer the question of why we would want to make ourselves free. And why would we want to reject this almost inevitable death drive and further, the inevitable pain. The inevitable hedgehog's dilemma. And ultimately, our inevitable death. In this video I will explore the work of Søren Kierkegaard and Albert Camus. I will make their concepts of the absurd compatible with death drive. And I will talk about Kierkegaard's sickness unto death and night of faith. About Camus' myth of Sisyphus. And I will negotiate between the idea of Stirner's unique and Camus' figure of Sisyphus. And of course I will also talk about Evangelion. Yeah, Evangelion is a very existentialist anime, as you will see. It even directly references Søren Kierkegaard's philosophy with the episode title of episode 16, which is called Sickness Unto Death. Kierkegaard is another philosopher who was strongly influenced by Hegel, and who also had some discontent with his philosophy. Very central to his philosophy are notions of faith and God. Yes, Kierkegaard was a very religious man, but let's take a closer look at his notion of faith and whether or not it's actually only applicable to religion. Faith for Kierkegaard is not a substitute knowledge, like for example creationism in lieu of Darwinian evolution. Faith is to be lived, to be understood. It is a passion, an emotional state motivated by an orientation towards something. Faith is what one attains after the absurd world has brought you to utter despair and made you resign. Yet in fact he calls someone who reaches the point of this infinite resignation, the night of infinite resignation. But to become a knight of faith means to understand the absurd, the paradox of existence, and to go on believing anyways. The Knight of Faith believes in some eternal principle, something that drives them to do not only just the right thing, because after all, even the Knight of Infinite Resignation can acknowledge the world the ethical values, but something beyond that. The Knight of Faith to Kierkegaard is someone very admirable, but whom he also does not fully understand, because of himself he claims that he lacks the courage to have as much faith as this Knight does. Essential to this notion of faith for Kierkegaard is what he calls the teleological suspension of the ethical. And yeah, we're gonna unpack that terminology, because that's kinda loaded. But it's very important because this is where we tie it into Hegel and into Evangelion. Kierkegaard characterizes the ethical as the universal. The universal thing that would be considered good, ethical in a society. Well, the particular in contrast to this is an actor or person within that universal. The responsibility of the individual is to express themselves in the universal or ethical, to annul their singularity or particularity. If an individual asserts himself as a singularity before the universal, he sins. An example would be, thou shalt not kill. Because killing someone is very clearly unethical. Yet this rule can be broken in particular cases if there's any ethical reason for doing so. For example, if you need to kill someone to prevent them from, let's say, killing 20 people, then this would not mean rejecting the universal ethical, but instead to reaffirm it. Because you break the ethical, in the name of the ethical. The reason why you break it is to reaffirm it, to protect it. This is your talus, your reason for doing it. But Kierkegaard asked us, 
is there not a talus for which we don't just reaffirm the ethical, but suspend it? What he posits here is a thought experiment, a paradox if you will. If there is a talus which allows you to pierce through the ethical and suspend it, then we have a paradoxical situation where the particular, the individual, stands above the universal, the ethical. Kierkegaard finds an example in the Bible in Abraham. But instead of going there, I will use Evangelion. So, we talked about how human instrumentality is the universal end of history for Hegel. It is about the best example for what we can find in fiction even, because it is so clearly a representation of sublation, of a universal ethical principle which unites all of humanity into one harmonious mass. We must ask then, why does Shinji suspend the ethical by leaving instrumentality? Why does he assume to stand above the universal as the particular? Simply, Kierkegaard would say, by faith. Shinji, after the infinite resignation we witness in End of Evangelion, turns around and carves something out of this. A reason to act. A faith in something essential to being a human. It is his wish to be a self despite the absurd, cruel world. And hope for the best. Hope, despite breaking the peaceful ethical realm of instrumentality, that things will work out his way. Which they don't, which we can see by the re-emerging dialectics when Shinji chokes Asuka. Yeah, even he himself can't contain himself from devolving into the spiral of the master and slave again. But he took the leap anyways. He willed himself back into existence. It is by the absurd that the single individual is higher than the universal. Only the absurd. In hey, let's make it a little bit more applicable to real life. The teleological suspension of the ethical can also simply mean acting by virtue of the absurd with faith in something. And not as a means to an end within the ethical. I really want to stress here a secular notion of faith is possible in this context. It can be the whims, the principles you find for yourself, your own self-constructed meaning in the world. This is not necessarily something we find in Evangelion, where everyone is struggling with meaning, but think simply of Utena in Revolutionary Girl Utena, who, due to faith in the prince she met as a little girl, acts princely, wears boys' clothes and has principles that she upholds. This too is not acting because of the ethical, but because of faith. In some way, the notion of faith contains the freedom to choose the eternal principle that you may uphold. And Kierkegaard also offers us another avenue to reject human instrumentality, which is very much tied into this idea. Kierkegaard argues that truth has to be connected to the singular, particular, and not to the crowd, the universal. The danger of the crowd is that you make the crowd rule by giving it your power. Every individual holds a certain truth between themselves and God, or what we would call subjective truth or meaning. But if you join into a crowd, your truth becomes subject to the truth of the crowd. Within a crowd, an individual becomes unrepentant, not responsible for their life or their actions. An individual does not have the courage to lay hand on the neighbor and kill him, but a crowd does. It takes courage to be an individual, but to be a part of the crowd means contributing your cowardice to the crowd. The crowd attacks people who individuals couldn't have attacked. Just think of Stirner's quote in episode 1, about that we desire a life apart, as individuals. The danger of merging into the crowd is simply forgetting that one is an individual. The single individual is the one for whom there is truth. We have to make our decisions about it. Kierkegaard urges us to dare to think, dare to figure things out, and not to rely on everyone else. If you communicate as an individual, you take responsibility for your thoughts. If everyone individually loves their neighbor, true human equality can be achieved. Not like the human instrumentality which is just a collective death drive where each person's cowardice of not wanting to live a real life comes together into an all-devouring crowd that pulls everyone in, if they want to or not. That's not human equality because it is one equal mass but a crowd is always constituted of single individuals and if they are prevented from becoming what they are, then you lose your individuality then you lose the exact terms on which you can even be equal with others. On the terms on which you can love your neighbor. You cannot be these things because you simply are not. But at any point there's a chance for the individual to leave the crowd. And Shinji finds an existence, an individual human existence. Something meaningful. A higher principle. 
higher than the universal, higher than the crowd. And he decides to live as that. But this existence is hard as we know. Kierkegaard sees existence as a sickness unto death. The sickness unto death is despair. Despair and never being able to be complete. To live in faith is to give this up, is to expunge the desire for completeness. Kierkegaard diagnoses that the whole development of the world tends in the direction of the absolute significance of the category of particularity. By which he means that we are, by the world and the process of history, more and more torn away from each other. Isolated. At Kierkegaard's time, this was the age of rationalization, where coherent communities instead were reorganized into systems of extreme division of labor. Multiple social roles, partitions between social and personal identities, and so on. In Evangelion, this is the constant catastrophes, the angel attacks, the warlike situations that tear school friends apart, destabilizes and destroys homes, causes waves of refugees, and of course, the general disorder of society, which causes people to alienate each other and lose connections. Despair, according to Kierkegaard, has two main shapes. First, the despair of a person who is reluctant to reach an ideal selfhood. Whatever may cause this reluctance, anxiety, insecurity, a lack of faith, a lack of courage, it is a person that will avoid putting in the work to reach this ideal. This idea of ideal selfhood, Kierkegaard posits, is fundamentally a self that conforms to the image of humanity as revealed by God, in the person of Christ. But let's secularize this again. What Kierkegaard really means is the way in which in front of God, the particular person loses any social identity, is naked and undifferentiated. It is an identity that is not shared by any social group, but only witnessed by God. We have here a solitary relationship of the self that perceives itself and judges itself, that only has one external mediator, which is God. And whatever we may substitute for God, maybe a secular faith and some irrationality deep inside of the self, maybe an eternal ideal to which one holds themselves. It is that ideal image which looks at the self evaluating itself, judging it. It is a figure almost like a superego that sees through all deceptions you may put on to the outside world and thus knows if you are the ideal self or not. And it is this judgment, this infinitely cruelly aware judgment, of which you are scared to ever properly measure up to in this despair. And then the second kind of despair. The despair of a person who actively rejects ideal selfhood. Again, this ideal selfhood being mediated by God would leave most of us to conclude that we'd really rather manufacture our own identities rather than accept this. But if we try and get rid of God in this equation, it would be more like the fact that you are aware of what is true and right, and what you should do and be, but you refuse consciously. Kierkegaard calls this despair because it might be a despair that plagues you without you being aware of it being despair. So let's focus on the first kind more so than the second. What this notion of Kierkegaard entails is the idea of individuality. Strip away all social layers and masks and God will see you spiritually, for what you are. And what you are is as absolutely particular and unique as it can be. Because your identity stops being assembled of the world around you, of what people expect of you, of what your role in a social group is supposed to be. Instead you stand before him, fully an individual. What this reads to me in the context of our little video series here is the following. Despair is death drive. It leads you to be anxious, too afraid to reach your ideal selfhood, living in avoidance, part of a crowd. The despair is to never self-actualize. To rise out of this despair is to strip away that which makes you be part of the crowd and become an individual. Shinji is spiritually reborn in an empty world where he is absolutely particular. And it can be said that in the face of this empty world where there are no expectations of the world on him, he is truly a self in the face of God, where there is nothing left but his ideal in himself that beckons him. Truly no social factor, no external gaze, no master, no slave. For a moment. Let me just further back up my claim that this despair is similar to Death Drive by quoting a passage from the book. When the danger is so great that death has become the hope, 
then despairs the hopelessness of not even being able to die. This tormenting contradiction, this sickness in the self, eternally to die, to die and yet not to die, to die death itself. The despairer cannot die. No more than the dagger can kill thoughts can despair consume the eternal, the self that is the source of despair. Yet despair is exactly a consumption of the self, but an impotent self-consumption, not capable of doing what it wants. For what he despairs over is precisely this, that he cannot consume himself, cannot be rid of himself, cannot become nothing. One can prove the eternal in a man from the fact that despair cannot consume his self, that this is precisely the torment of contradiction in despair. Heavy stuff. And yeah, this is pure death drive. And similarly to death drive, after working through the trauma, you can emerge as a self from it. Episode 16 of Evangelion is the one titled Sickness Unto Death. It is the one where Shinji is trapped inside the angel Lelio, stuck with his despair, slipping in and out of consciousness with the angel speaking to him about his shallowness. This should make us think. They are angels. Angels, of course, associated with God, religion. And here Shinji is having a close relative to God judge his existence. He is in the face of God, merely someone in despair, not becoming his ideal self. And then you just gotta love how the resolving moment of the scene is an encounter and a memory of Shinji's mother. Death drive and despair are equal, and Arno, not sticking with either model alone, merges them, recognizing the psychological contents of Kierkegaard's work and seamlessly fusing them with Freud in this particular scene. And while I'm on it, the angels themselves as an invading pulse of Hegelian world spirit are posing the antithesis to humanity. This is what makes Gendo recognize a way out of the despair of mankind. Arno here applies the religious symbols of standing in front of the face of God to not only individuals, but the world. The judgment of God compels Gendo to take the move towards an ideal self for the world. Towards human instrumentality, where the angels sublate the humanity in a truly dialectical way by turning them into goop. But here we inch closer to the true nature of Hegelian dialectics. Just as the angel's impulse towards world spirit and humanity sublate into instrumentality, so does Kierkegaard's individual irrational pulse towards individuality dialectically return, and this individuality and instrumentality sublate each other into the re-emergence of the human individual, with the same re-emergence of despair. The thickness unto death is despair. Kierkegaard sees the cure to the sickness and becoming a self in the face of God, recognized by God. Although this perhaps may just simply be a substitute for the self that can no longer properly be put together in social life. And after all, though he may not openly say so, it might be that which he actually intends. He deals with the absurdity of existence by trust and faith. This is where the next philosopher we're going to talk about enters the frame. Albert Camus. He accuses any form of trust and faith as an avoidance of the true absurd, which is the absolute incomprehensibility of the world. If he substitutes for his cry of revolt a frantic adherence, at once he is led to blind themselves to the absurd which hitherto enlightened him and to deify the only certainty he henceforth possesses, the irrational. Camus deals with the absurd, with this sickness-inducing world, by spite and revolt, not by faith. For Camus the world is utterly meaningless, no, even further, it is absurd. No matter what we do, what we struggle for, what we might wish, dream, believe or achieve, any second you could be hit by a buff and die, unceremoniously, without a place in a grander narrative. We just simply exist until we die. Our attempts to actively make meaning of it gradually lose credence, become dysfunctional, fail to serve us, fail to account for what is happening around us properly. Early traces of this can be found in Christian philosophy. The question that always comes up again, why would God allow this? Something not easily negotiated with a religious belief in an all-powerful and well-meaning being. And what can truly be more absurd than the glorious human race with its history, 
technology, culture and so on facing an almost certain extinction in a war against alien invaders. The third impact marked a complete breakdown of previous society, only re-erected under military law. The fourth impact is the ending looming at the horizon, the one thing that invalidates all human strife thus far, the absolute unimaginable absurd ending of everything any of the characters ever cared about. But even with their almost certain awareness of a timely death, they hurt each other. They miscommunicate and are stuck in beliefs and senses of duty. They withdraw into their room and cry, are hurt, as if in denial. Camus is aware that facing the absurd is making yourself aware that there is no hope, that there is nothing bigger to bet on, no invisible hand that will make you comfortable and protect you from the outside. In this context Camus talks about a feeling of being homesick for an orderly world. A longing for a world that still makes sense and is easily understood. In this way it reminds us very clearly of the death drive, which seeks to return to a previous state of life in order to avoid the complexities and trauma. A despair until you die, or as Kierkegaard would put it, life is a sickness unto death. For Camus the essential question of philosophy is that of suicide. But instead of taking away from this meaninglessness of the world that he should give up, he said precisely the opposite. The meaninglessness itself challenges you to rise up against it. He says, man confronted with absurdity has basically three choices. The first is suicide, the second is the leap into religion, and the third is to embrace the absurd. Suicide is the inability to deal with absurdity. To make it a little more nuanced, I would even argue that we can equate this one with Death Drive. Even though Death Drive is not literally referring to suicide, but Camus also includes the differentiation between physical and philosophical suicide in this. In this state of apathy, philosophical suicide, the state of nihilism, there is distinctly a lack of living, as we discussed, undead and so on. In Camus' eyes, suicide eliminates the absurd rather than dealing with it. This is why the solution does not satisfy him. Then there's the leap into religion, into faith. Let's not equate this directly with Kierkegaard's face, which I think comes much closer to the third category of embracing the absurd. This is rather a more general religiosity, although Camus did have some criticism of Kierkegaard. The third and only actual answer for Camus was to recognize the absurd that your responsibility here is to face it head on, to confront it. He argues that by acknowledging the absurd, you gain power over your life, since it changes your relationship to societal values, goals of your own life, and recontextualizes your being in the time until you die. This is where Camus suddenly approaches Stirner. Stirner too saw that societal values, morals and so on were only a deification of man. As in, we replaced the god of pre-enlightenment philosophy simply with man. Man is the end in himself. All these values, morals and decrees justified by man, all these spooks, as Stirner would have said it, put in your head to domesticate and shape you, instead of giving you the ability to create yourself out of the world. Camus too finds that the absurd and rejecting suicide and religion allows you to live without being trapped by those to live freely, day by day, without someone else's or society's grand narratives, aspirations and goals projected onto you. But it also means to live freely despite the suffering, despite the pain. Life with absurdity for Camus is a constant revolt. A constant revolutionary struggle against a cruel, absurd world. And he compares it with the myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus punished for all eternity to push a boulder up the hill, only for it to roll back down so he has to restart. Camus says we must imagine Sisyphus happy. Despite his absurd fate, which is the pushing against the rock and struggling that leads to an inevitable failure again, he musters again and again a reason to do it anyways. To revolt against this fate. Kierkegaard's description of his knight of faith, who fully embraces the absurd and acts by virtue of the absurd, does eerily remind me of Camus' Sisyphus. Just remove God and faith, replace it directly with the absurd. Without God and faith being a mediator for the absurd, Sisyphus can still find a reason to roll the rock back up the hill, a talus. A talus that is outside of the ethical because it is fully absurd. But he knows it is, and he does so anyways. And along the way he smiles and is enjoying his struggle. 
the teleological suspension of the ethical then would be not motivated by God, but by something so singularly unique and irrational, so free and absurd, that it can only come from the whims of an individual's joyous embrace of the absurd. And that is where we reach the existentialist's idea of authenticity, as hard as it is to make out and fully get a grasp on. And this is where we also return to Stirner's unique. Another way it characterizes the unique is by explaining this figure as a creative nothing. As in, that which is left after stripping away all roles, all external values, all imposed morals, and so on, is merely nothing. No metaphysical grand narrative, just nothing. But a creative nothing that can see, observe, pick the part it likes, and make them his own. The creative nothing thus exists unbound by values, unbound by identity, and unbound by commitments to them over time, as constantly destroying and constructing itself out of the pieces it chooses to make its own. The creative nothing is like Sisyphus, constantly freeing himself from external values, struggling against the world, endlessly becoming, until death. In fact, the moment Sisyphus stands atop the hill, when he has finished pushing up the rock and sees it roll down, Camus says his way is at its highest. Fully aware of this absurd struggle, like the creative nothing, he sees all the parts that make up his being and is able to freely choose to go and push the rock up the hill another time. These figures of the Knight of Faith, the creative nothing and Sisyphus are not figures outside of the world. No, they are within it. They assemble themselves with it and find their own reasons to do so, refusing to become part of a larger universal. And don't we witness something very similar in Evangelion? Faced with the inevitability of pain, the hedgehog's dilemma, and a completely destroyed world, potentially alone forevermore, Shinji still wills himself into existence. He wills himself into existence out of the fanta soup of Death Drive and re-emerges. Evangelion makes it painfully clear that the struggle is not over. Sisyphus is not absolved from pushing the rock up the hill again and again. He wakes up and immediately gets into conflict with Asuka, reaffirming exactly that there is no easy solution to this, only the will to push on. These two brave people have had the will to carve themselves out of the death-like death drive by acknowledging the absurd by realizing that they still want to be themselves. In spite of all this, by finding a conviction in exactly this pushing back, they recognize the worth of their uniqueness and they recognize the worth of living on, struggling to live happily and freely. Because to live is to choose and to experience with your senses. For there's nothing to existence other than this. And if these things don't exist, you don't exist. And here we can see that Evangelion is very distinctly existentialist. Now that we've explored the personal dimension of why you want to resist Death Drive, I want to take you to a different world of meaning in Evangelion. One that I often find painfully neglected when interpreting it. And it is more about society, history, philosophy itself, and politics. We're gonna talk some more about the criticisms which Camus had about Hegel, and we're gonna look at how Eva depicts a rift with modernist meta-narratives, very much in the spirit of Jean-François Lyotard. Also, we're gonna expand on psychoanalytical and Hegelian ideas by looking at the work of Slavoj Žižek about ideology, and discover the concept of the death and rebirth of Hegel.